Hi, everybody. This is Jay Menon. I'm Chief Scientist at Fungible and very excited uh, to be here today to talk to you about how we are thinking about computational storage at Fungible. Now, this is an exciting topic. Uh, it's, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of excitement here going forward. Um, so let's give a brief background on what is computational storage and why do, see, why do people see value in it? Now, um, the easiest way to think about computational storage is it's about moving compute closer to the data instead of moving the data to where the compute is. So instead of moving data from the storage to the uh, host CPU or host server, this is about taking some of that computation and moving it very close to where the data is actually stored. Now, what is the benefit of doing this? What are, what are the perceived value propositions of computational storage? Well, first of all, um, less data gets transferred to the network. Um, if, uh, if you're trying to uh, do computation on data to gather insights from the data, then if you, if you move the computation of the insights to the data itself, then all you have to move are the insights, not all of the data. So you have much less data transferred and where you have a network bottlenecks, those can disappear. You can get faster response times. You also get improved security because you don't actually have to send all of the individual data bits up into the compute over the network you're sending much less information. And finally, uh, because of the reduced footprint that can result, um, this is because you, you need less networking, which means you might need less switches, uh, you might need less server compute power, um, you can also end up with less physical footprint. So these are all the reasons why computational storage uh, is exciting. Now, there's several approaches. Uh, many people are working on computational storage. Um, and uh, here are some of the approaches that you will see as you scour the industry landscape around computational storage. Some people um, move the compute directly onto a drive, a spinning disk or a SSD. Um, others move the compute into a storage array that houses many uh, SSDs or many HDDs. Yet others uh, have the compute platform, for example, on the NVMe bus to which uh, many storage devices are attached. So there's just many different ways to do this. Um, furthermore, uh, what, what kind of compute uh, is moved closer to the storage? Um, there are implementations of computational storage that use FPGAs, um, yet others that use GPUs. Uh, there are also um, uh, approaches where an ASIC is used perhaps with an embedded ARM core. Uh, and in our case, uh, we, uh, we're using DPUs as the compute horsepower that's close to the storage. The final bit of background I want to make sure I share, of course, and I'm sure many of you that are listening to the stock are fully aware that there are a standards activities that are in progress, both with the SNEA uh, Technical Working Group uh, and with the NVMe Computational uh, Storage Task Group. Um, and uh, we at Fungible are also uh, participating in some of these uh, to just make sure that um, you know, we are big believers in standards and we want to follow the standards as they become available. Let's talk about uh, some use cases. Um, uh, these, are, these are use cases. It, several of these uh, on this chart are ones that we at Fungible have encountered as we talk to customers. There are also some examples here uh, that, that you, you'll find uh, when, you, when you Google the literature. Um, that, that, the, that the working groups at SNEA and others uh, have done a careful job uh, of curating uh, some of these use cases. Um, so let's talk about a few of these, particularly the ones that you know, we at Fungible have encountered. Um, the database acceleration one is one that we encounter frequently. The idea here is that 
when you're trying to scan uh, or do aggregations on data, for example, take an average or take a sum, you have to read all the data. A and the traditional approach means that you have to read the entire database and then compute averages on some field. Um, if you had compute power very close to the storage, then you can do that computation of the sum or the average um, in the storage device itself. And this can drastically reduce uh, the amount of data that actually has to flow from storage um, to the compute. And you can use the, the parallelism inherent in large numbers of storage devices all with compute being able to do this, this aggregation or the sum or this average. So this is a use case. We, we, we find customers very interested in this. Um, a second use case that also um, we have uh, uh, experience with uh, is big data analytics, where uh, some form of insight is generated directly on the data itself. Um, and this reduces the, the actual amount of data that needs to be sent up to the server. Um, there are several use cases here. You could think of them as edge computing use cases um, where the computation is done kind of close to the edge where the data is being generated and then does not have to be sent over a network or in some cases a wide area network. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're a smart vehicle, a smart car, uh, some of the processing uh, to figure out that it's a smart, it's a stop sign that's approaching. You really want to do that right, right at the uh, at the vehicle itself, and not send it up to a cloud. That might take too long anyway, and you might have blown by the, the by the stop sign by then. So those are clearly examples of computational storage. Image classifications, another one which you can do very close to the data itself. For example, you might want you might be looking for human beings in the images, and if you if you if you classify an image as a human being, maybe those are the only interesting ones for to be sent for further processing uh, up to the compute server. Um, another example that we encounter a lot are I'll, I'll call them science uh, experiments, science labs, national uh, national labs. Uh, leading research universities. There are a lot of uh, examples where uh, filtering very close to the data is, is almost crucial uh, to get the kind of performance you're looking for. For example, um, if, uh, if there are a trillion particles uh, that are stored on storage and your goal is to find, say, the, the thousand most interesting uh, or most energetic particles of the trillion particles. Um, that's an example of something that can be done in parallel across all the storage devices. Um, the alternative is to move all that data up into the compute layer. Um, and that, that just takes too much time. So typically you have to build fancy software schemes with indexes uh, to go figure out exactly where those most energetic particles might be. And that those are complex uh, software schemes uh, uh, and, and sometimes you know, more brute force techniques like doing all of the searching in parallel uh, is actually better than fancy software techniques. So, so we encounter that a lot. Um, and uh, one, you know, the last example here on the slide is a CDN uh, networks. Uh, where uh, the type of data that, that needs to go to the end user, you know, is often determined by where the end user is, um, by the kind of screen they have. Is it an iPhone or is it a more powerful screen? And all of that manipulation that's needed before the data is sent to the end user can be done at the source of the data itself. So these are all good examples. Um, like I said, I think uh, for fungible, We've seen a lot of interest in, in the database world, in the big data uh, analytics world, and in the science experiment world in particular. Now, you know, as we uh, mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, our own approach is very, uh, very focused on using the fungible DPU. So it behooves me to tell you a little bit about the fungible DPU, what it's good at, and therefore the kinds of computational 
storage uh, that it would be a really good fit for. So let's begin by talking a little bit about the fungible DPU. Um, you know, it's a new class of microprocessor. It's purpose built to do data centric computation very, very fast. And by data centric, we mean stateful, multiplexed processing of high bandwidth streams. Uh, so things like um, uh, storage, things like networking, things like security, these are all examples of data centric computation. Um, so anything having to do with large high bandwidth streams of data, this is what the DPU is really good at. And in particular, it's at least 10 times better at these kinds of things um, than uh, general purpose CPUs. So we think it's a really good fit for uh, dealing with storage, for dealing with high bandwidth streams of data that you're pulling from the storage and being able to do the computation on that data as the stream passes by more or less in real time. Um, and that's, that's why we think the fungible DPU is particularly uh, attractive for computational storage. The fungible DPU is also very good at um, uh, implementing uh, networking um, and, uh, and building, you can build uh, extremely good data center networks on top of standard uh, tors and spines um, that the DPU is very good at that. That also really benefits this computational storage kind of activity because it's really about storage and then moving the data over the network. So improving the storage, improving the processing, improving the network to move the data back up. All of that is what the fungible DP was really built to do. Um, just a little bit more detail on the fungible DP and you'll see why it's a really great computational storage engine. If you'll peek inside the fungible DPU, what you see is lots and lots of cores and lots of lots of threads. Um, so in this, um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, DPUs that Fungible has built is the F1 DPU. Um, and the F1 DPU is 192 hardware CPU threads and dozens of accelerators. Um, and you, know, you can see the accelerators uh, on, the, on the block diagram on the right side of this picture, uh, the, there's, there's six shown, uh, six accelerators shown, uh, DME for data movement, DLE for data lookup, the DSE for data security. So this would be things like encryption, uh, DRE for data reduction. This would be things like, you know, compression uh, and so on. So, so those are the kinds of, uh, uh, accelerators that are really built into the DPU. So this combination of lots and lots of cores, uh, and these are special cores that are really good at data centric processing. And then lots and lots of accelerators. This is what makes, in our view, the DPU very powerful for doing uh, computational storage. Now there's one more really interesting advantage of using the DPU in particular, the fungible DPU um, for computational storage. And that is shown in this picture. So uh, once again, in the middle of the picture, you'll see uh, the cores, which are the circles in blue, and you'll see the accelerators, which are the squares at the bottom. So as I mentioned before, this chip um, has lots and lots of cores, the circles, and lots and lots of uh, hardware accelerators the squares. Um, and on the two ends, you'll see it's got connectivity uh, to a PCIe bus, which is the way it can talk to storage or talk to a computer uh, server. On the right side, you know, it's got uh, connectivity to the network, um, 100 gig, eight times 100 gig on the F1 DPU. And the way that we program this chip, this DPU, uh, is by writing C code that runs on those circles. And then any time that it needs to access an accelerator of some sort, um, we've built very high bandwidth memories and very high bandwidth networking inside the chip. So it's just a 30 nanosecond delay uh, from writing from a piece of C code 
running in one of those circles to um, the hardware uh, thread that you want, the hardware accelerator that you want to use. Um, and, and so it's like a data flow diagram. And you can see at the top of the, the graph, you can, see the, you can see the data flow. So you can see some computation that happens in a core, then it goes to a hardware accelerator of some sort, uh, then it goes back to a core, et cetera. So you can see that flow. And this is very powerful because, you know, we have many different kinds of flows uh, that you have, uh, that we've already programmed to do storage functions uh, on our, uh, on our fungible storage using the fungible DPU. Um, and any, any extra computation you want to do is simply uh, uh, another core that you might want to insert into this data flow. So it's just a very natural way to extend what we are already doing and the programming style that we already have. It's very natural to, to add something, add a piece of code into one of those flows to say, oh, by the way, as it's coming off the disk and before you send it out on the network, you know, do this, do this other little computation. Hey, take an average. Uh, and so it just fits very, very naturally. And therefore, I, I, uh, you know, it, it's our belief that, uh, that it makes it very, very easy to do computational storage on the fungible DPU. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the fungible storage device itself, because that ultimately is where the computational storage will happen. You're basically enhancing an existing storage box to do more things like the computational storage activity. So let's talk a little bit about what the existing storage uh, box looks like, uh, and that leads to how we do computational storage on it. So um, our, our F1 uh, DPU was used to build uh, a storage box, um, and we, uh, we um, got a set of requirements for what that block storage device should look like from talking to customers. And those requirements, you can see down the left side of the chart um, with the attendant benefits that come from that on the right side of the chart. So, uh, you know, it's it was very clear to us that for next generation data centers, you really want the storage to be disaggregated from the compute and sitting on the network. Uh, so that was the first requirement very high performance, and in particular, very consistent performance was very important. So that was the second requirement. It needed to be scale out. So you could start small and you can add a node and add another storage node and add another storage node and grow capacity, grow performance um, very, very easily. Um, compression and encryption, and particularly doing these at line rate without slowing down the performance of the storage was very important. So we added those features into our product. Multi-tenancy was very important because uh, especially in the cloud world, you have multiple tenants uh, and they all have different requirements for what protection do they need? What encryption key do they want to use? What quality of service do they want for, for, for performance? So, uh, so those were factors we took in to build our storage product to be multi-tenant and to provide on a per volume basis, uh, protection attributes, encryption attributes, and quality of service attributes. And all of this can be managed through a REST API um, uh, to, to, to manage many petabytes of data. Uh, the storage provides rack scale resiliency without having to do uh, two or three copies of the data. It uses erasure coding across the network to provide rack scale resiliency and it can support VMs, containers, and bare metal. So that's the set of requirements that drove uh, what we built for our fungible storage. Um, and that's the, um, that's the basis on which we, we further added computational storage. Now, one thing I wanna point out on this chart is some of these things would not have been possible if we really did not build it using a DPU. So our storage is actually built entirely using a DPU, there's no general purpose uh, CPU inside it at all. It's built entirely with the DPU. And in particular, things like line rate compression, line rate encryption, rack scale resiliency with network erasure coding, and the extremely high performance, these things 
it was really critical to have the DPU with its capabilities that I described to you before. Now, here is an example of, uh, here is a picture of what the fungible storage looks like. The fungible storage boxes are the ones shown on the right. Uh, you'll see about six plus six, 12 of these boxes shown on the right. Uh, each box is a 2U box. It has two DPUs inside of it and it supports 24 SSDs. And it can support as, as much as 15 million uh, IOPS. This is the very high performance capability that we talked about. It supports the standard NVMe over TCP protocol, as you can see in this picture. And then on the left side of the picture, you can see the servers. Um, these servers run, uh, run uh, for example, Linux operating system, and the Linux kernel comes with the appropriate drivers to speak NVMe over TCP. Um, and so we have a separate control plane uh, shown at the top of the picture. The three boxes are actually our control plane and that exposes a REST API. We have a Kubernetes plugin and OpenStack plugin. We're big believers in separating control plane and data plane. And so all of the control plane activities like create a volume or take a snapshot, that comes in through the, uh, through the control plane. And then once the volumes are set up, the reads and writes go over the NVMe over TCP uh, fabric uh, from the server on the left to the fungible storage boxes on the right. So that's, a, that's, a, that's in a nutshell. Um, don't wanna spend more time talking about the storage. I really wanna show to talk to you about how we add computational storage capability on top of that. Now, one last point I want to make, uh, this is very crucial to, uh, to computational storage, is, uh, is talking a little bit about the performance of the box uh, using a particular metric that, uh, that, uh, that we introduced uh, to the industry about a year ago. Uh, this is a metric that we call the performance efficiency percentage, or PEP. Um, and the PEP is really very, very simple to understand. And that's part of the reason we introduced it. It's very intuitive. It's very easy to measure and it applies to all workloads. Um, and it doesn't have some of the uh, downsides of other metrics like response time and, uh, and IOPS and so forth, which are very dependent on workloads um, and very dependent on the specific SSD you're using, et cetera. So the PEP is very simple. All the PEP says is, hey, if you've got a box, you've got N SSDs in it, uh, you, can, you can look at the, the, the throughput uh, or performance capability of those N SSDs. So let's say the SSDs are capable of uh, 100 IOPS each, you have 10 of them, 100 times 10 is 1,000 IOPS. That's the fundamental underlying capability of the SSDs. Then out of the top of the box, how much of that can you deliver to the application? So if you've got a thousand IOPS capability and you deliver only a hundred IOPS to the application, then the PEP is 10%. You're only doing 10%. So obviously what you want to do, the ideal PEP is a hundred percent. And if you, if, you, if you look at many storage systems, you'll find the PEP is, is quite low. You know, SSDs today are very, very powerful. You can do a million IOPS from an SSD. You take 24 of them, you get you know, 24 million IOPS, uh, and then you'll find storage systems that can barely deliver half a million IOPS. So that's, that's you know, half divided by 24 then becomes the PEP. So ideal PEP is, is 100%. Uh, for us, the storage that we have built, um, we're, we, can, uh, we, we have a 95% PEP, so very, very close. Uh, to the 100 capability with one DPU supporting 12 SSDs, we're pretty much able to support 95% of the capability of 12 SSDs with this one DPU. It's very nicely matched in that sense. So we're not getting in the way um, of, of the performance of the SSDs at all. And this is even when we add extra features like compression and like encryption and so forth. The reason this is important is when you add computational storage capabilities, when you add additional activity like doing averages and, and uh, sums and uh, you know, delivering insights, 
you want to you want to keep that pep as you know as high as possible. You want to be able to do this computation as close to the speed of SSDs as possible. So this is this is why I I wanted to focus on this particular metric over traditional metrics like IOPS and latency and so forth. So I think PEP is what's really important for computational storage. And um, I think Fungible does a very fine job of raising the PEP. Now with that as background, let's get into how we do computational storage. So now you know about the DPU, you know the storage box that we've built using the DPU. Let's talk about how we do computational storage um, on the uh, Fungible storage cluster. So we have three approaches uh, at Fungible for supporting computational storage. Um, the first one um, is a, um, uh, for those of you familiar with EVPF, this is the Berkeley packet filter style of approach. Essentially um, uh, what you do is you write your computations in C um, on a server of some sort. You, you, know, you, you compile it and you download the code to the DPU and then the code is called as needed to execute the downloaded code. So you can really execute any computation you can write in C and push it down to our storage box and let it execute. So this is very consistent, by the way, with the computational storage standard uh, that is being developed uh, in the NVMe uh, computational storage uh, task group. Uh, it's very consistent with that. And I, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're big believers in standards and as the standard develops, we're watching it and we will certainly follow those standards. Um, now the second approach, you know, one of the accelerators we have is a regular expression engine. And so we use that regular expression engine um, to look for patterns in streams of data. So you specify the pattern you want to look for um, using a Perl compatible regular expression language, PCRE. So you say, this is the pattern I'm looking for, go find it. Um, we compile that to state machine code that's downloaded and it's loaded into the DPU uh, on the storage box. Then as streams of data go by and the streams can come in from the network, the streams can come in from storage, uh, doesn't matter. Um, you can insert uh, you can insert this code uh, to look for that pattern, and it's re we're really using our hardware accelerator in this case uh, to uh, to look for those patterns. So that's a second style of computational storage that uh, that we are enabling in the fungible storage box. The third uh, kind is using domain specific languages. So you express the computation in you 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 want done on the storage box in a domain specific language. This might be SQL or Apache Spark that gets compiled to code that runs in the DPU. So there's, there's, a, there's three different ways in which uh, someone can use the computational storage capabilities of the fungible storage box. So let's just dig in a little bit into each one of these. Um, the first one is the EVPF style of downloadable program, very consistent with the standard, like I said. So here you have the computation that's written in C. Um, the, the above the line there, that horizontal line is, is um, stuff happening in a standard server where the compute is written. Um, and then you can basically load that code onto the fungible storage box, which is shown at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then when you're ready to execute it, you can, you can, you can ask that, that it be executed. Um, in our case, um, you know, there's different, um, different places where this piece of code, which I call the filter on the slide, uh, can be executed. Yeah, for example, uh, as data is read, it can run through the filter that you just wrote and see and downloaded. And then the, uh, the output from that filter, only the filtered records can maybe then written to a second volume on a, on a second disk, for example, um, or the filtered data can go straight up to the, uh, to the host computer. We have a lot of flexibility. The reason we have this lot of flexibility is because of that data flow approach to programming that we talked to you about. So we have different flows 
We have flows where data goes from you know, one volume to another volume. We have flows where the data goes from one volume up to the host. We have flows where the data is coming on over the network and being written to disk. And this filter code can be inserted into any one of those flows, thereby allowing a lot of flexibility in what someone can do with our computational storage. Um, a little bit more detail uh, on, on the steps of the workflow to download and execute the code. You write the code in C. Um, in our example, the, you know, data from a source volume is filtered and only the filtered contents are written to a destination volume. So the code is compiled using the standard like GCC compiler. You create a, a linkable format module, which is then downloaded into our fun operating system, which is running on the DPU. It's inserted into some existing workflow, and then you basically run the filter code. Um, and uh, you know, as part of part of the run, you specify what is the source volume from which the data should be read, what is the target volume into which it must be written. You specify the length of each of the records. Uh, because as a, as a block storage device, you don't know that. That's part of the that's part of the run command. You specify how, how how large each of these records are, and the code knows the format of the fields within the records, and and the source volume is read, and only the filtered content is then written to the destination volume. So that's an example of a flow. Uh, as the standard gets um, formalized, we'll of course follow the. the the, the standard, but this is very consistent with the standard. Let's, uh, let's take a second example. Let's talk about how the regular expression engine uh, inside the DPU can be used to do different, a different form of computation. So in this case, we're looking for patterns. And so what we can do is we can specify those patterns using the Perl compatible regular expression. And then we run it through a compiler that we have in Fungible. This runs on a standard x86 server. That creates a state machine, which is this triangle. That state machine gets downloaded now into the Fungible DPU. Once it's there and the regex engine inside the DPU is ready to go, we can now start sending a payload uh, into the Fungible uh, storage box and uh, all the results that match uh, come out on the other side. Uh, we also allow you to apply actions on the match results, uh, which may let you say, hey, drop this uh, packet, drop this record, forward it somewhere else, or transform it in some way. All of these uh, are things that are doable uh, with the approach that we're taking. <clears throat> so this allows us to do at, at very high speeds um, pattern matching at extremely high speeds using the built-in regular expression accelerator that's inside the DPU. So what I wanna show here is that we support uh, a very large set of what the Perl compatible regular expression language allows, which means that you can specify uh, very, very complex patterns you know, with case sensitive uh, characters with sets, with named classes. Uh, we support all of the special ca characters like carrots for uh, the, the, the beginning of a string. Um, we support alternations and closures. Um, it doesn't matter if you really don't, you know, are not familiar with regular expressions. The point that I'm trying to make on this chart is that we, we, we support a, a, a very, uh, most of the the capabilities of the PCRE language. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a simple example um, and try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so this is an example of a sample pattern where you're looking for, let's say, some, you know, uh, a flash bar with a, with a space after it, uh, and, then, uh, and then one or more, uh, you know, toolbars after that. Um, and so, you know, the, the way we specify that is by giving a name to the pattern uh, and then uh, by specifying the delimiters of the string that I'm looking for uh, and then the pattern itself that I'm searching for. And this, this is a way for me to, um, 
uh, to look for different kinds of patterns. These are some very complex patterns I can look for. Here's where I'm looking for, essentially, you can see I'm looking for email addresses of a certain type, something at something dot, you know, com dot xxx. So I'm looking for, uh, you know, email addresses, etc. So just to give you a flavor of the kinds of patterns we can look for uh, in streams of data. And um, what I, what I want to share with you here is the kind of performance we're able to get with our regular expression hardware. Now, the way to look at this is um, across the bottom there, uh, you see uh, that um, we're really searching for uh, emails, uh, email addresses of various types. Um, and the performance really depends upon how many patterns you can search for in parallel. So email 20 says I'm searching for 20 email addresses, 20 different ones all at the same time in the data as it's flowing by. Uh, 200 says I'm searching for 200 different ones. And you can see I go all the way up to 20,000. So I can be searching for 20,000 different um, email addresses in, 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 the, in the pattern, whether the, whether the data is coming off of disk, whether the data is coming from the network, you, you can see that I'm, you know, uh, I can, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, in this particular uh, test run that we did, I'm, I'm looking for up to as many as 20,000. And then within each of those 20, 200, 2,000, or 20,000, um, uh, th there's four more, which are, you know, a simple, simple type of email addresses, more complex type of email addresses. That's the last four on the right. Um, then within each of those buckets, you know, there are there's four color coded uh, uh, bars. Bars. Now, um, what that is is uh, performance also depends upon whether there's a lot of matches in the data or there's no match at all in the data. So, so really, the um, uh, the blue, uh, the dark blue, is really where there's no match in the data. If there's no match in the data, you can go faster than if there is, let's say, one match per megabyte, which is the light blue, or one match every 64 kilobytes. Uh, so more often, there's more matches. Uh, that's the purple. And, and then kind of the really dark blue or almost black on this slide is one match every kilobyte. And of course, that, that'll be the slowest. But in every case, you can see our performance is north of 150 megabits a second. Uh, I'm sorry, um, 150 gigabits a second, all the way to close to 200 gigabits a second. So it's very powerful performance uh, being able to do that at those kind of rates uh, using the regular expression engine and searching for 20,000 patterns in parallel all at the same time. We can do even more actually, but for the runs, uh, this is what I'm uh, what I'm showing you today. So the third and final uh, way that you can express computations uh, and have them execute on the fungible storage devices using domain-specific languages. And we, um, so I'll give you two examples. Uh, we have built a plugin for Spark. So any Spark program, uh, you use our plugin and the plugin then uh, creates a program uh, we call it the crunch program that, that, that then gets uh, executed on the uh, fungible storage device. And essentially you're running Spark programs this way. Um, and you can do the same with SQL programs. We have an SQL front end we've built. And once again, that gets um, translated to this crunch program that then is executed on the FS1600. So, so a yet another very powerful way, a third way, a very powerful third way for you to express computations is using well-known domain-specific languages like Spark and SQL. Uh, these, are, these are very well-known, widely used in the industry. And um, this, is, uh, this is also uh, something that we are, are, are supporting uh, um, in, in one, in, uh, in one form or the other at, uh, at, the fun at Fungible. So I think that uh, brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. I kind of want to summarize what I have told you 
Uh, this is our approach to comp computational storage. How do I summarize our approach to computational storage? One is that computations are pushed to our storage appliance. We call it the FS 1600. Um, uh, and the FS 1600, as I told you before, it's built using two DPUs and 24 SSDs. And we are using the large number of threads, 192 threads in the case of, a, of one DPU, so two times that in an FS1600 because it's got two DPUs, 384 threads, and lots and lots of these multi-threaded accelerators, including the regular expression engine, which is one of those accelerators that we talked about. So using that, that is how we execute computations. And I've also shared with you that we have a very high performance efficiency percentage or PEP metric, which means that we are able to keep up with the speed of SSDs uh, in doing these computations. Uh, I shared with you that the computations can be expressed in three different ways. Um, one is just in C code, you write your code in C, we'll insert it into one of those flows that I showed you and, and execute that. Um, you can specify patterns to be searched for uh, using regular expressions. Uh, by the way, this too is supported um, in the emerging standard. Uh, it's what the standard calls a device defined program. Our device will define this regular expression as a kind of program that we can run. And therefore it really does fit within the, within the emerging standard. Uh, um, uh, and then thirdly, you can specify the computation you want in domain specific languages uh, like SQL and Spark. So we've got a plethora of ways for people to be able to use the computational storage capabilities um, that, that we are building uh, in, in Fungible. And finally, um, I want to point out that one of the natural advantages we have is that the way we do computational storage is really a natural extension of the fungible DPU programming model, which as you saw was that data flow uh, data flow programming model. And really any computation can be plopped into the middle of one of those existing flows, allowing many different combinations of, uh, of where computations can be inserted into flows uh, inside the fungible DPU. So um, hopefully that's been very interesting and enlightening for you. Uh, we look forward to continue to develop our computational storage activity. We look forward to the continued evolution of the standard um, and continued interaction with customers that have interest in, interest in computational storage. We think this is an exciting new, uh, a, a new dimension to storage, uh, and we look forward to working with our customers and with the industry in moving all of this forward. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>